Uh, we're in a series called A Better Hope, and we are looking at the power that's available to us because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, the power that was revealed on Easter Sunday when he rolled away the stone. That power is available for us today. Today we're talking about the power that we have over the devil. And uh, two kids are talking on the playground, and one, of the, one says to the other, hey, do you, do you, do you think the devil's real? Do you, do you believe in the devil? And the other kid responds, nah, I think it's like the tooth fairy. It's really your father. <laughs> and some of you can relate to that. Uh, many people in our culture believe the devil's a fictitious character or, or maybe just the personification of evil. We have this stereotypical image of a, a guy in red tights with a, with a pitchfork and, and a pointy tail. But I have to tell you that the devil is real and alive in the world today. The Bible describes him as a powerful, angelic commander leading rank upon rank of angelic beings and many of them followed him in his rebellion against God and became what we call demons in the world today. Let me tell you a story. I, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not one of these guys that has his, this great ministry of exorcism and things like that. But before Life Spring, I was a youth pastor at a church in Camarillo, Camarillo uh, Community Church. And one night, I was holding a parents meeting for, for the parents of the youth. And when a car pulled up, and we were meeting in the fellowship hall, the side of the, the fellowship hall was all glass, and that's where the parking lot was. A guy pulls up in his car, parks there, and he left his lights on. And the lights are shining right through the window, kind of in my face. And, and it was a little bit distracting. I kept expecting him to turn the lights off, kept expecting him to turn the lights off. And, and when he didn't turn the lights off, I finally went outside uh, and, and to ask him, you know, would you, would you please uh, tur turn the lights off? Well, the driver is sitting on, uh, in the driver's seat with his arm resting on the steering wheel. His left arm is just on the, on the window. The window's rolled down. It's on the door. And he's looking straight ahead. And as I come out to talk to him, he just motions me over to the passenger side. I'm like, okay, well, this is a little odd. Maybe the guy doesn't speak English or something. So I walk over to the passenger side, and, and I look in the window uh, of this vehicle, and a woman is sitting in the passenger seat, and I ask her if I could help her, and she growls at me. Now, I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean this woman actually growled at me. And I looked over at the man, and the man is sitting in the driver's seat of the car, and his right arm is resting on the steering wheel. His left elbow is out the window, and he's looking straight ahead. And I'm thinking, okay, this is weird. So I said, excuse me, and she looked at me, and I'd been looking at the driver for the last second or so. She looked over at me, and no lie, the skin of her lips were pulled back all the way on both sides, I could see her rear molars. I looked at her eyes, they were blood red. The white of her eyes were just red. And she looked at me and she growled like a wild beast. I hope I don't need to tell you that the blood drained from my body in that moment. My blood pressure just plummeted. My, my heart rate went 1,000 miles an hour. My body all tensed up. I could feel the adrenaline pouring into my body. And, and I did not know what to do, but I knew I needed to protect myself from this woman. So I stuck my hand out on her forehead, and I just started praying for deliverance for this woman, but also to keep her in her seat. And, and, and I am praying for deliverance for this woman, and I'm telling you, she starts vomiting all of this. She's swearing at me. She's cursing at me. Her arms aren't moving, but she's threatening me. She, the foulest things you can imagine are coming out of her mouth, and I am just praying my heart out. My assistant youth pastor saw that something was going on out there, and he came out to see if he could help me. He walks out the door, looks over, hears what's coming out of her mouth, sees her face, turns around and walks right back in. 
I asked him about it later. He says, I, I, I went in so that the rest of us could pray for you. <laughs> Thank you. You can pray for me right next to me, you know. So I continued to pray. Suddenly she screamed a single high-pitched scream, fell unconscious in the seat. My heart is racing. My blood pressure at this point is through the roof. I look over at the driver. He's sitting in the driver's seat. His right arm is resting on the steering wheel. His left elbow is out the window, and he's looking straight ahead. And I'm thinking, do you not even know what just happened? He's completely oblivious to what was going on. I look back at the woman as she's beginning to regain consciousness. She looks up at me, and no lie. She says, thanks, I needed that. <laughs> I looked at her, I says, you need a lot more than that. You need Jesus. And I shared the gospel with her, and I asked her if she was ready to surrender her life to God so that she was not going to be oppressed by these forces of darkness. And she said, you know what, right now I am just so exhausted, I need to go home. I said, let's just pray. And she says, no, I need to sleep. Wait. All right, so I got her phone number, prayed for her one last time. She left. Kept me up all night, this woman. So I, I thought 7 o'clock was too early to call her, so I called her at 7.30. Now, I don't call people at 7.30 in the morning, but I called her at 7.30 in the morning, and a man picks up the phone and I asked if I could speak to her, and, she said, and he says, well, who are you? I said, well, I'm Pastor Tony from uh, Camarillo Community Church. And he says, do you know this woman? I said, yeah, I was meeting with her last night, and, and she was tired, and we needed to continue this morning. And he says, well, she died this morning, about 4 o'clock. And my heart just dropped. Turns out he was an EMT, had been called out to the house, and was dealing with the situation. Have you ever met a woman like that? Guess what? You've all met people like that. You have. You just don't know it. You just don't, we just don't recognize them. We meet people like that every single day. You live in a world inhabited by people just like that. You don't recognize them because they look so normal. This woman didn't look normal. But what was happening inside of her happens to the majority of the people who live in this country. They are being oppressed by forces of darkness we cannot see and they do not recognize. Open your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 8. We're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at the whole, uh, the, we're going to be looking at the whole story. We're going to look at it in Mark's gospel. We're going to read in Matthew's gospel this morning, uh, the opening part of this story. Let's go ahead and, and there's no taking outline, as Joe said, in your, on your app and on the website if you want to follow along. Uh, go ahead and let's stand. And there are some hard copies here for those of you that are here. If you want to go back to using hard copies, they're in the back there. But let's go ahead and read um, from Matthew uh, chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Read it with me. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus, and he cast out the evil and, and, and healed the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said he took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. It's the word of the Lord. Let's pray and see what God wants to teach us. Father, take your word this morning and, and, and help us to change the filters on our eyes. Help us to look and see the people in the world around us and how they are oppressed by an evil they don't understand and cannot comprehend. Lord, help us to be a voice of truth in a world that is dominated by deception and lies. And we ask it, Lord, for your kingdom's sake. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat uh, this morning. I want, to, um, I want to read this story in its entirety from Mark's gospel. We'll be looking... Um, here in Mark chapter 5, if you want to turn in your Bibles. 
This is a story that might be familiar to you. It's about a man who's demon-possessed who lived in the region of Gad on the side of the Sea of Galilee. He lived in the tombs and, you know, cut himself and did all kinds of crazy things. And you remember that part of the story. But what I want to tell you this morning as we look at this story in its entirety is that the madman in the tomb gets center stage when we tell the story. But there's a lot of people in this story that are demonized. Not just the madman. He's he's the one that that captures our attention. He's the one that's kind of in the spectacular role. But there's a lot of people. There's actually two other big groups of people in this story that are just as demonized as he is, but they look normal. They look culturally relevant. And so we think they're okay. Let me read the story for you. It says, Jesus and the disciples went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he'd come out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had, had, he had been living among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. And constantly, night and day, among the tombs and in the mountains, he was crying out, screaming, and gnashing himself with stones, gashing himself with stones. And seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he says, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he'd been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Jesus had been saying that. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And they answered, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to entreat him earnestly not to send them out into the abyss. But there was a big herd of pigs feeding there on the mountainside. And they asked Jesus, saying, Send us into the pigs, send us into the pigs, that we can enter them. And Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, The unclean spirits entered into the pigs, and the herd ran down the steep bank and jumped into the sea, and 2,000 of them were drowned in the sea. And those who tended them ran away and reported in in the town and out in the country, and the people came out to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus, and they observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they became frightened. They're not frightened of the madman. Now they're frightened, because Jesus is there. And those who had seen it described to them how it had happened and the demon-possessed man and all about the pigs, and they began to entreat Jesus to depart from that region. And as he was getting in the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was asking him if he could accompany him, and, and Jesus didn't let him, but he said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went off and began to proclaim in Decapolis the great things that Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. It's a great story. Begins when he had come to the region of the Gadarenes. If you're not familiar with this area in Israel, the descendants of Gad, along with uh, Reuben and half the tribe of Manasseh, back when Moses was divvying out the land, they came to Moses at Kadesh Barnea and they said, hey, we don't really need God's promised land. This area here is good enough. Let us have this land here. You guys can have God's promised land. You guys can have God's best. We'll take this area here because we can settle our families here. We can settle our herds here. We'll still come over with you and fight the inhabitants of the land and deliver the land into your hands. We'll still do what we promised to do. But we don't want to be bothered 
going over the Jordan. Let us settle our families here. Let us settle our animals here and, and give us this land instead. Let me tell you this morning, the first thing the devil wants to do with you is get you to give up God's best for what is good enough. That's what the devil wants. The devil doesn't want you to possess you and turn you into a raving lunatic. That's not, that's not his, his end goal. His end goal is to get your eyes off of Jesus and he would just as soon get you away from God's perfect plan for you to settle for good enough. Don't do it. Don't do it. They did. They surrendered God's best and settled for good enough because it was easier. And the result was that when enemies attacked Israel, which they did for the next, you know, 2,000 years after, after Moses, 1,500 years after Moses, when enemies attacked Israel, guess who the first people to be conquered were? Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh that settled for good enough because it really wasn't good enough. It just looked good enough. And they got carried away into captivity and they intermarried with the, the, the people of the culture and they gave away their inheritance. They eventually lost their relationship with God to the point where we find these descendants of Israel, recipients of the law of Moses, raising pigs in the land of Israel. Pigs. God says, unclean animals. God says, don't mess with those things. Don't mess with them. And we find them raising pigs. Now, of course, the the devil is the master of justification, and he will help you justify turning your face away from God just a degree or two, and then another degree or two, and then another degree or two. He will help you justify what you're doing. I mean, think about these people living there in the land of Gad on the east side of the Jordan River, and they're thinking to themselves, hey, did God actually say we couldn't raise pigs? I read the text. He doesn't say we can't raise pigs. He just says don't eat pigs. Pigs. Now, if these Romans like their pork chops, and most of these other Jews want nothing to do with the pigs, if we raise pigs, we can have the corner on the market on pigs. And we're not eating pigs, we're just selling them to the Romans. We're, we're not, we're technically, we're okay. That's like saying, I don't use heroin, I just sell it to high school kids. That's okay, right? No, it's not. No, it's not. When God tells us to do something, he doesn't mean follow the letter of the law. He means understand the spirit of my heart and do not just this, but everything around this. This is your, this is what is best for you. Don't settle for good enough. From their homes on the east side of the Jordan River, traveling all the way to, to the tabernacle twice a year for the appointed feast, man, that was too much work. That was too far. That was too inconvenient. After all, you know people say, you don't have to go to tabernacle to worship God, right? You can worship God anywhere. You've heard people say that in our generation. Instead of tabernacle, they say church. But it's from the mouth of the devil speaking into their ears and helping them to justify good enough instead of God's best. The devil always turns half-truths into lies. At the time that Jesus is getting out of the boat 2,000 years ago, these people are more influenced by the Greek culture of their day than they are by the Jewish religion that God gave them, written by his own hand on Mount Sinai and given through Moses. They have forgotten about God's law. They have no knowledge of this promised Savior that he's going to send so that the very Savior that God's going to send steps out of the boat into their land and they have no idea. All they can see is a crazy man who gets healed. Listen. Listen to me. Out of sight is out of mind. When we put 
God's word out of sight, it goes out of our mind. When we put God's rules out of sight, they go out of our mind. Once you justify not joining God's people for worship at Tabernacle, it's easy to confuse what is right. Listen to me. It's easy to confuse what is right with what is culturally relevant. We live in a world where we're being attacked by demonic forces, and they don't look like a crazy man shackled living in the tombs. They look like the opportunity to choose what is culturally relevant versus what is right by God's word. Don't do it. Don't do it. I mean, you begin by accepting cultural relevance as acceptable rather than what God says is right. And then it's like, well, I mean, pigs are animals too. Why can't, uh, pigs are animals too. Pigs have the right to be eaten just like any, just like any other animal. Right? And we, we begin to justify things. Why can't we eat pigs? Everybody else is eating pigs. Come on, Moses, have you even tried bacon? You stop reading God's word because it makes you feel guilty. And before, it, no, before you know it, you're a Gadarene. It says, when Jesus climbed out of the boat, the man possessed by the evil spirit came out from the cemetery to meet him. This man lived in the tombs. Couldn't be restrained. Whenever you put chains on him, he broke them. Day and night, he wandered the hills, screaming and hollering and cutting himself. Almost sounds like a modern-day horror flick. Yet we come in contact with people like this every day. Remember, remember what I told you. The madman is not the only person in this story that is oppressed by demons. They all were. They all were. It just looks different. We read this story in, in, in 20th century, 21st century, and, we, and we, we look and we, we focus on the madman because he's getting all the attention, but it's like the woman in the car. I was focusing on the woman in the car because she was, got my attention, but the guy sitting next to her was just as demonized, and I completely ignored him. Here's the thing. Once you turn your back on God's word, once you read something here and it tells you what to do, it tells you how to live, it tells you how to to follow God, and you say, that doesn't apply to me, and you turn your back on God's word, once you do that, you are in the devil's grip. Maybe not like the madman, but you're in his grip nonetheless. The difference is the madman knows what he's doing. The madman knows that he is possessed. The madman knows that he's out of control. Can you imagine his shame? Can you imagine his shame? It says he's screaming in in the hills. I'd be screaming too. I'd be so embarrassed, so ashamed. I'm sure that's what he's feeling. Can you imagine carrying around that weight of that truth in his life? This man lives in the tombs by choice, by choice. His shame is so great that it's the only place he finds peace. How does someone get this way? You get this way by distancing yourself from Jesus. One step at a time. Jesus said, anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. Bob Dylan sang a song right? You got to serve somebody. I could actually sing a Bob Dylan song. You got to serve somebody, right? I mean, yeah, I got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. In this world, we have to choose sides. We have to choose sides. You choose to serve Jesus or you end up serving the devil. You don't deliberately choose to serve the devil, do you? But you just, you choose not to serve Jesus in a particular case, and guess what? You're on the devil's side. And it's real. It's real. He makes it look like you're serving some good cause. But I'm telling you, you are either serving Jesus and what he says in his word, or you're serving the devil. And you don't go to church on Sunday 
looking all good and holy and wake up Monday morning a raving lunatic cutting yourself with stones and living in the tombs. We descend those stairs one step at a time, one choice at a time. Our country was founded on, by godly people based on biblical principles. And over the last 200 years, we have surrendered each of those principles one by one by one by one. And today, you and I don't even have to cross the Jordan to find Gadarenes. You can just cross the street and find Gadarenes. Find people that have justified rejecting God's word, rejecting God's ways, rejecting God himself. Remember, the raving madman is no more demonized than the Gadarenes raising pigs. They just look normal, culturally relevant. Be on your guard. The devil is real. The devil is real. Right after his baptism, Jesus was led into the wilderness, and there he was tempted by the devil three times to take the easy way out, the one that didn't involve the cross, the one that didn't involve obeying the Father. And in each case, Jesus overcame the temptation by embracing the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God. And if you think that that ended Satan's temptations and attacks against Jesus, you would be wrong. Luke says when the devil had finished tempting him, he left Jesus until the next opportunity came. Listen, listen. The devil is not God's equal. He's not God's equal. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. He is not all-powerful. He is not everywhere present. But I will tell you this. Listen to me. He's not, he's not God's equal, but he is a demoted archangel. <laughs> he's not more powerful than Jesus, but he is more powerful than you without Jesus. If you try to do this without Christ, you're going to wind up like the, the seven brothers of schism or whatever his name was that went running naked through the streets, right? With Jesus, you can defeat him. Alone, you cannot. When Jesus had gone up to the Mount of Transfiguration, he took three of his disciples with him. Nine were left down on the ground. Took three, left nine. A man with a demon-possessed son brought him to the nine the majority of the disciples. And the disciples said and did all of the things that Jesus taught them to do when he sent them out. And they couldn't heal the boy. And when Jesus returns, he looks at the situation, speaks a word, heals the boy, and the disciples want to know why they failed. Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. In today's language, Jesus is saying, Resisting the devil is all about the strength of your relationship with me. If you find yourself raising pigs when God says not to, or whatever that is for you that God has told you, do this and you're not doing it, or he said don't do this and you're still doing it, if you're raising pigs, the problem is not the pigs. The problem is that your relationship with Jesus needs to get better. This kind does not come out except by prayer, except by spending intimate time with Jesus Christ. When this pandemic started, we had to figure out how to balance our, our physical and our spiritual health. We had to balance obedience to government authorities, and, which is biblical, and obedience to God's authority, which is also biblical. See, God says, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now, especially now when you see the world is coming to a close. The world is wrapping things up. The pieces are starting to go back in the box. Especially now, we need to be gathered together. I'm so, I am so excited to see so many of you here this morning. I really am. We need this. And if you think you don't need this, believe me, I need you to be here. I need us 
to be together. I do. And, and, and I mean, Letty came all the way from Oregon just to be here with me. And she gets to see her son's birthday while he, she's here. But, but we all know why, why she came, right? I mean, we won't tell him, but, but we know why she's here. We need to be together. It's so good to see so many of you here today. We need this. We need this. Now, the thing is, and, and, and I'm speaking to some of you, not all of you, but some of you who are on the live stream right now. I mean, the thing is, the government authority has loosened the restrictions based on the, the level of COVID uh, infection in our county. Uh, they've said, hey, you can have 150 people in your, in your church services now. We can do that. So why aren't Christians coming back to church? And I'm not just talking to Life Spring. I'm talking to all my pastor friends. We all say the same thing. Why aren't Christians coming back to church? Now, some of you have real health conditions that put you at a higher risk. And I totally get that. I totally get that. Some of you are just playing it safe, but how safe, do it, how safe does it have to be to follow Jesus? Because I'll tell you right now, following Jesus has never been safe. Ask Jesus how safe it is to follow God. It's not always safe, but it's always right. It's always the right thing to do. Amen. Thank you. Whoever said that, amen. <laughs> See, the devil wants to use this pandemic to cripple the church, to silence our voice. But he can only do that if we let him. I think that MJ and, and, and Matt Lemieux and, 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 and um, Frank Myers and, 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 and Phil Smith and Paul Simborski and, and Pastor Paul Ware, I, I think you guys have done an amazing job. You've done a heroic job to deliver. Amen. Oh, and our camera people, we got Jason and Sarah and Dean. You guys have done a heroic job of delivering a quality live stream so that people that can't be here in person can still get the best experience possible. And I'm glad, I am so glad we've been able to do that. But I talked to people on Easter Sunday who I haven't seen for over a year who told me that as much of a blessing as the live stream is, it's not the same as being here. And I agree with them, it's not. It's not the same thing. We can't be the body of Christ if we're not together. We can't. We can learn things about the Bible. We can, we can sing songs. We can even worship God. We can grow in our discipleship and our understanding, but we cannot be the body of Christ if we're not together. All we can be is disconnected body parts. And disconnected body parts, I'm, I'm not a doctor, but my understanding is disconnected body parts end up in the tomb where this man was. When you make a fire, it can burn so hot that you can't even get close, much less touch, touch the logs. But if you take one of those logs out of the fire and you set it on the side, it only takes a few minutes before you can pick it up with your hand. It gets cold, and if you leave it there long enough, it'll eventually go out. The devil's goal, the devil's goal is to make you cold spiritually. I am inviting all of us this morning to come back to the fire. Come back to the fire. Come here where the Spirit of God is burning brightly. I need you. And whether you feel it or not, you need me and us. 35% of our county, 35%, that's over a third. 35% of our county has been vaccinated. I'm talking both shots, not just one. But we're not seeing a 35% increase in church attendance across the board. We're not. Now, I know, <laughs> I mean, I know, 
I, I, I see the social media posts too. I mean, I know people are saying, I, even the news, they're saying after you've been vaccinated, you can still get COVID, uh, you still have to wear a mask, and you still can't gather in large groups. They said that this last week. People that we should be listening to said that this last week. Well, I researched it this week. I happen to have access to scientific journals. And I looked at it this week, and there have been several studies about getting reinfected after being vaccinated. And guess what? The numbers are a fraction of 1%. A fraction of 1%. And I'm telling you right now, test error is greater than that. It's totally possible that those that got COVID after getting vaccinated, it was a testing error. It's possible. But at any rate, the, the risk is low. The devil is lying to us. The devil is lying to us. And you know, most of the cases where people were supposedly reinfected after being vaccinated, they were asymptomatic. They had no symptoms. The only reason they knew is because they were, in a, they were a test subject and they got tested. They had no symptoms. Most of them. So, I mean, we're talking, we're talking a neg negligible percentage. I'm your pastor. And, I, you know, I'm probably stepping on some toes this morning. But I'm your pastor, and I love you. I love you. I can tell you that those guys that are telling you whatever they're telling you, they may be smart, but they don't love you. I'm telling you the devil is stealing from you something that is your right as a child of God. And it breaks my heart. Come back to the fire. I'm telling you, since this thing began, I've been here every Sunday. Paul Simborski, Phil Smith, MJ. We're here every Sunday. We are willing to die to shepherd this congregation because that's what God called us to do. God is calling us to be the body of Christ. Come back to the fire. You guys aren't listening very fast this morning. <laughs> Second point, the devil's strategic. The devil's strategies are to use lies and fears to divert you from doing what God wants you to do and to use sin to keep you so distracted and occupied that you aren't paying attention to what he's doing or what Jesus is doing. That's what the devil's strategy is. Lies and fear to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. And then to get you embroiled in some sin so that you're so distracted and so occupied you're not paying attention to what's happening. Jesus has a strategy too. In Ephesians 6, we are told to gird ourselves with truth. Put on the belt of truth. Gird yourself with truth like a belt. Wrap it around you. Righteousness like a breastplate. Put it in front of you. Act righteously. Live holy lives. Faith like a shield that you put before you. And salvation like a helmet to protect your mind. In addition, equip your feet with the sharing of the gospel, the sharing of the message of the good news that Jesus loves us and saves us. And then take up the word of God like a, like a sword to fight back against this culture and against the devil. You get dressed like that every morning and you will be able to stand against the devil no matter what he does. And if you're listening to me right now and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need the helmet of salvation first. You need to call that number that, that Joe gave us this morning. You need to email me at pastortony at lscc.us. You need, you need to help. let us help you. Get into the kingdom of God. Get Jesus as your Savior because you can't stand against the enemy alone, but you can stand against him with Christ. When this man was still some distance away, the man saw Jesus and ran to meet him and threw himself at Jesus' feet. This man, tormented by demons, living in the tombs, knew he needed help and knew where that help was from, knew he needed Jesus, and so he pursued him with intensity. The devil is relentless, and you need to be equally relentless in your pursuit of Jesus. Finally, remember this. The devil is allergic to the gospel. 
you can put him into anaphylactic shock like that. Just start living your testimony. Live and love like Jesus in this world. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding in the hillside nearby. Send us to the pigs, the spirits begged. And so Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man, entered the pigs, and the entire herd, 2,000 pigs, uh, jumped off the, the hillside into the water. You know, people, people read this story and they're going, why in the world did the devil, did the demons want to go into the pigs? Why in the world did Jesus listen to the demons and do what they wanted? Uh, what is going on here? I'm telling you, I, I've read this passage this week several times trying to figure this out, and here's what I think happened. I think Jesus is doing an Obi-Wan Kenobi in the first Star Wars movie. These are not the droids you're looking for. These are not the droids I'm looking for. They can go. They can go. Be gone. Be gone. I don't remember the exact words, but, um, but I think that's what's happening here. The devils, the demons, they have to submit to the voice of God. They have to submit to the command of God. Jesus looks around the, the hillside there and says, what in the world are my people doing raising pigs? If they're so stupid as to be raising pigs, when God tells them not to, I know what to do with the pigs. Let us go into the pigs. Let us go into the pigs. We're going to run off the cliff and drown ourselves in the sea. We're going to run and drown, drown ourselves in the sea. Be gone. Be gone. I think they were just obeying the, the voice of God. Those pigs were supposed to be there. And so Jesus used the demons to get rid of the pigs because he loves his people. He loves his people. They may want what's good enough, but Jesus always wants what's best for us. And no, in case you're wondering, this is not where Jesus invented devil tam. This is not what this is about. At the end of his encounter with Jesus, this man, now in his right mind, wants to get in the boat and go off with Jesus. Of course he does. Of course he does. The man who'd been freed from the demons begged to go with him. Jesus said, no, I need you to go home. Jesus tells him, one day you will be with me for eternity, but not today. Today we have work to do. Today you are free, free from fear, free from sin, free from hell, free from the power of the devil, free from the tombs that have been your home. Today I'm leaving you in charge. Tell everybody what God has done in your life. They know who you are. They know who you were. They know your story. They will listen to you. Tell them. And we read later in the Gospels, Jesus returns to this region. And when he does, he finds 4,000 people waiting for him waiting to listen to him, and they're so excited to listen to him, they listen to him for three straight days. This crazy man, this man who was hopeless in bondage, in chains, in the tombs, was given hope, mercy, and a future, and a voice, and a message worth sharing, and they listened to him. So what about you? Do you live your life in such a way that after talking to you, people can't wait to meet Jesus? Because you have discovered a Savior worth meeting. Don't let the devil steal your voice. You live your life on a ship. And every day, people are falling overboard and are lost at sea. You don't know who or where or when, but you are on a mission to save them. You may talk to a woman one evening who's facing a Christless eternity, and she may be obviously demonized as the woman that I talk to, or she may look perfectly normal like the guy sitting in the, the driver's seat, or like the pig farmers on the hillside, or like the people in the town. But they are rejecting God somewhere in their lives. And they've given the devil a foothold and he has taken a hold of their heart and of their lives and you are the hope of the world. You can offer them help and comfort only to have them die before you can call them 
the next morning. And I don't want you to live with that like I lived with that for a number of years. Live each day. End each conversation so that you will have no regrets in the morning. Remember our Easter lesson. Jesus still moves the stones. And whatever stones that are standing in the way of you rejecting the lies of this world and embracing the truth of Scripture, turn to Jesus today. Ask him for freedom. Be relentless. And then go and tell people all the great things that God has done for you. Kept you a little late today, but hey, I'm worth it. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this story, Lord. And, and I can't tell you, Lord, how many times, you know how many times I have read this story and all I've focused on is the madman in the tombs. But he was just one person that had been demonized. There's a whole group of pig farmers. I mean, enough to take care of 2,000 pigs that had also been demonized. But they had been demonized in a culturally relevant way. They, they, you know, hey, we're on this side of the Jordan. We're, we're like, we got special dispensation to raise pigs. We're okay over here. And then there's the people of the town. They're not raising the pigs, but they're living in the town. They're living off of the, 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 the revenue from the pig farmers. They're, they're accepting what is clearly a biblical violation, but they're accepting it because it's culturally relevant, because it's beneficial, because they get some benefit from it, and they're all, they're all demonized because the minute we reject you and your word, we're in the devil's grip. Wow, Lord, I just pray that as this week goes forward, that as we continue to think about these things, as we continue to allow your spirit to work into our heart and into our mind the truth of the word of God, I pray that you would bring conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I pray that you would give us victory and hope, that you would set our feet on a solid ground. You would break the chains, whatever they are that are binding us, where we have said no to you and the devil has enchained us to habits and addictions and, and just thoughts and attitudes that are consistent with the world but are in opposition to your word. God, deliver your church. Deliver your church from lies. Deliver your church from fear. Lord, we love you. We love you because you first loved us. And if anybody is listening to this right now and they have never surrendered the leadership of their life to you. Give them the faith to believe right now. To put on that helmet of salvation for the first time. To just reach out to you with a prayer, Lord Jesus, save me. That's enough. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And Lord, if any of your people are listening to this and are feeling conviction God, I pray that you would minister forgiveness and mercy even as you call them to a deeper level of relationship with you, a deeper level of holiness. Help them to put on that breastplate of righteousness to go into this world living holy lives and then shod our feet with the gospel of peace that we might, that we might live and love like Jesus in this world. God, we ask it for your kingdom. And all God's people said, amen.